allow people to join us. We're all coming flooding in, which is lovely to have you here today. This is our fifth in the Lone Worker Safety Live series of webinars. Today's is Lone Working After Lockdown. And we'll wait just a few more moments to allow more participants to join us. We've got as many as 400 people joining us today. So it may take a while to get everyone in almost 100 already. Welcome everybody, welcome today. We've had a fantastic response to our previous webinars. They've been a great way to share information, answer some pressing questions, keep in touch with all those in the Lone Worker community. So if you've missed any of these, let me just take this opportunity to say that we've recorded them as we're gonna record this one today. And they're on the Lone Worker Safety Live YouTube channel. So please do check them out. And there's some really great information on them. So I suggest that you do that. Hello, everyone. We've got a lot of people. We've got almost 100 people today. Hello, Courtney. Hello, Donna. Hello, Gail. Welcome today. Well, let me get started by saying that you're here for our fifth Lone Working After Lockdown webinar, part of the Lone Worker Safety Live series. My name is Kristen Gasser and I work with Worthwhile Training and I'll be hosting this session today as my colleague, Nicole, who usually does the honors, will be sharing her expertise with you today as one of our panelists. So you can ask her all your tricky questions and we do want you hopefully to send in your questions throughout the webinar and we'll try and get to many of them as we can. We're also delighted to have with us today Matthew Hunt who specializes in health and safety for BPHA which is a large stock, stock, housing trans stock transfer housing association. Sorry Matthew, put that around. And today's webinar is being sponsored by Solo Protect. Solo Protect is a lone worker solution provider delivering 24 seven protection to tens of thousands of lone, mobile and remote workers offering a range of dedicated services and applications. So do look them up if you're interested in lone worker solutions. And besides sponsoring this webinar, Solo Protect is also one of the key exhibitors for our upcoming conference which we're really excited about. Lone Worker Safety Live, the only event in the UK to focus on the safety, security, and well-being of lone workers. Uh, the day, you know, it's, it's a great day. It offers engaging speakers, helpful exhibitors like Solo Protect and interactive workshops, as well as opportunities to network and to ask your questions of experts. And the original conference date, which was in October, has been moved to next year. So we're now looking forward to greeting everybody in person on the 23rd of February, 2021 at our new venue, Lord's Cricket Ground, which is very exciting. Just don't ask me how to play it, but I'm very excited to go. You can register online at the web address, loneworkersafetylive.com. And for joining us today, use that code webinar10 to receive 10% off the delegate rate. So we do hope to see you there. And so now we've got over almost 200 people now. Can I just spend a little moment and check out how we're gonna operate on Zoom? Now I imagine that many of you feel you already have an advanced degree from Zoom University. <laughs> but here are a few things to help you find your way around the screen if you're not using, used to using Zoom as a webinar. If you're new to Zoom, it's fairly intuitive. Um, as it's a webinar, you as participants cannot be heard and you won't be seen, but you do have control over what you see. So for instance, you can look at the top right hand corner there. Um, you have the option to toggle between gallery view, speaker view, or you can pin the video of the speaker you wish to see by hovering over their image, clicking on the three dots there and you can select pin video. So you can choose, you can also toggle between a PowerPoint presentation and the person speaking. Um, across the bottom there, you can see the control bar. There's a number of things there. Please use that Q&A box. It's there on the far right to send us your questions. 
rather than the chat box. So that will keep them all in one place for us to look at. We do have our colleague Louise on the webinar today, so she'll be there to help you if you have any technical questions and she'll be helping also us to review your questions and send them on to us. A little note about the questions. If you are asking a question, you can tick a box to make it anonymous if you don't want to have your name associated with it. So feel free to use that option if you want. There also will be a poll or two today, which will pop up in the middle of your screen. You select your answer or answers that you want to send in and do know that the results will be anonymous. We won't know who, will, who has said what, but we'll be able to share all the answers with you today. And also this will be recorded. As I mentioned previously, all of our webinars have been recorded, so you'll have the opportunity to listen again or point, or point others to it after today, and that will be up on our YouTube channel. So hopefully that gives us a sense of where we are. Are we all ready to start? We have a fair amount of people. Do you wanna raise your hand? If you, are you all set? Can you hear me? Can you see us? Hopefully, yes, I see hands raising. Oh, lots of hands raising. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. All right, I think we're off and running. Let's get, let's going. Let's get started. Today, our subject is lone working after lockdown. And, you know, it's, it almost, it, it doesn't need saying. So much has changed since um, the beginning of this in such a short time. So much is still up in the air about how to return to work safely. And I think depending on the work you do and the organization you work for, you may feel that lone workers are the least of your problems. You know, if they're alone, then I don't have to worry about designing social distancing protocols. But of course, you know, if you are a lone worker or you manage lone workers, there can be significant issues to consider and to address. Returning to work can be stressful and adjusting to the new norm may take some time. And if you're a lone worker, either you're working alone remotely out in community, or you're working alone at base, or you're in your own home, this may create new challenges and present new risks to, ask, to assess and to control. And so our two speakers today will hopefully provide you with some helpful facts, a few concrete strategies perhaps, and I'm sure some food for thought. So. Let me welcome both Nicole and Matthew, our experts on loan working today. Nicole Vasquez is the Director of Worthwhile Training and she's the host of the Loan Worker Safety Live Conference. She's been helping organizations manage risk to their staff for over 25 years across sectors, including retail, rail, housing, and government departments in the UK and beyond. So she'll be sharing all her knowledge and insights with you today. And she'll be joined by Matthew Hunt, Health, Safety, and Environment Office for BPHA. Um, it's a housing association operating across the whole of the Oxford to Cambridge arc. So he'll be sharing his on the ground experience of managing the safety of his teams as they return to work. Um, both Nicole and Matthew are willing to answer your questions. So do pop them into that Q&A box at any point, whenever you have them, and we'll try and get to answer them, get them to give you their answers answers to your questions to as many as we can today. So hopefully that set the stage. No more for me. Over to you, Nicole. Morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, that's good. Thank you, Kristen. That's great. Real good, solid introduction to where we're heading today. So at least oh, good. Knows what we're doing. That's good. Thank you. Um, so look, let me just tell you a little bit about me um, in terms of the work that I've been doing over the last year or two, which has been quite interesting. I was part of um, a key stakeholder group that helped the HSC review their um, guidance on protecting loan workers. Um, and, and this has been quite an interesting process, actually, for me, because it was an opportunity to talk to a lot of people specifically about kind of rules and regulations and how we manage these things. And, and obviously, normally I'm out there talking to clients um, about their own specific Specific issues but it was useful to kind of look at it in a much broader sphere um, and that's been actually really helpful as we've gone into the lockdown and coming out of the lockdown as well um, 
When the, the group looked at the definition of loan working, it was decided that actually the health and safety definition stood well and that there was no real change needed in that respect. So the new guidance that came out in March of this year stuck with the old definition of loan working. And if I'm looking over to the side, it's not that I'm ignoring you, it's just that my slides are over there. Um, so it talks about this idea of an individual working without close or direct supervision. But I've got to be honest, for a lot of my clients, that isn't a big enough description. It isn't a clear enough description. It's too vague. Um, and so when I ask them about whether they have loan workers, we have to have quite a long conversation to define what we mean by loan working before they can actually answer where their loan workers are. But in the new definition from the um, health and safety executive, what they've decided to do is to split this into three specific categories. So you've now got loan workers who are at a fixed base. It might be an office or a warehouse or a, a factory or wherever it might be. Um, or they might be remote out and about. So they could be delivery drivers or maintenance engineers. It could be community workers going into other people's homes, etc. But they don't have a fixed base to work from. And a lot of those will work directly from home. This time around, the HSE has actually put a new category in there and really clarified whether people working at home are loan workers or not. And they've said the answer is yes. And clearly they've said that people working at home, even if there's family, um, family don't count as supervising or directly, supervise, uh, co directly supervising people. Although to be fair, if you talk to my husband, he'd probably have a different answer to that one. But um, legally and officially, the answer is no, they're not supervising you. So you are alone working if you're at home. And I think that's really important thinking about how many people we've now got doing home working. They also looked at this idea of the categories in terms of your employment status. So they've said, look, definitely employees, obviously, we know we've got that duty of care to employees. But they also talked about the idea of volunteers. And we know again recently that a lot more organisations are using more volunteers perhaps than ever before. So it's important to know that they are um, our responsibility too. Excuse me. The third category that they were really keen to um, make sure that we reflected was this change in the way that we work. There's so many more people now doing part of what's called this gig economy. You know, they work on contract by contract basis. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that actually employers recognise that if they're using employer uh, contractors or people in this gig economy, that they still had to make sure that they had that duty of care and went through the same process for them as they would do everybody else. So there was those three categories that got added. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't just about the health and safety side of it or the traditional kind of personal safety and security side, which we know for a long time has been recognised as an issue for, for loan workers. But I wanted to really champion this idea that we need to be aware of people's mental health and well-being when they're loan working, because I think isolation and stress can be a real issue for some people. And I think, you know, nothing has put that more into the spotlight than, than people working from home and remotely during the COVID-19 lockdown. So I think it was a really good move by the HSE to take on both the working at home element and also the well-being element and adding it into their definition and their guidance. So it's worth noting if you haven't seen the new guidance that came out in March, have a look. You can get it on the website and we'll send you a link to that afterwards. But that kind of makes, begs the question, so what do your loan workers look like? Um, you know, have you got people still working at home? And according to the government guidance, if you can, then they probably should, still should be doing so. But those people that are coming back to work, are there some loan workers in new roles that maybe where they didn't loan work previously? And that might be to do with shift patterns changing. You know, I know a lot of people now are opening up their offices very early in the morning and working through to quite late in the evening to allow people to travel, um, you know, at different times and to avoid that rush hour. So it's thinking about that and, and maybe retail environments where there's not enough customers to warrant having two people in. So one person will do or maybe one person in this area and one person in that area. Well, are they loan workers? It's, you know, that's kind of a, a question. But I wanted to kind of poll a question for you first thing, really. Um, just thinking about COVID-19, has loan working in your organisation changed? Um, and there's several options there that you can um, choose from, either sort of a yes and it will continue as our new norm. Some might say I don't actually know or we've got less loan working before. But just for us to kind of get an awareness, I think it'd be helpful for Matthew as well to know kind of who we're talking to and to see what, what people are saying. So I'll give you a minute or two just to answer that while I take another slurp. <clears throat> Okay, 
So we've got now over 200 people on the, uh, on the line. So that's going to take a while for people to click and make up their minds and read through this. So while we're doing that, I'll just move on to my next slide and, and let you carry on voting. Um, loan working post COVID-19 lockdown. Let's start with the premise that loan working has fundamentally not changed. You know, it still is what it is. The definition have, hasn't changed. We've got more clarity about who we should be including and what we should be looking at in terms of um, our risk elements. But loan working hasn't fundamentally changed. Apart from there are some things that I think may have changed within your businesses. The first is about frequency and situations that people are loan working. I think potentially there are many people now that are loan working who've never done so before. So again, it may well be that you've worked um, in an office and normally there's lots of people there. And now because of kind of splits of, of shifts that, that you know, you're now working on your own and you've never done this previously. I was talking to a client last week and they said that they've moved their, uh, their cleaning services to now come out of hours. Normally they used to come in at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day, but they've kind of moved them away so that they don't interact with their staff. But then that means that those people are truly loan working. There is nobody else in the office at eight o'clock at night when they've kind of um, agreed with them that they're going to come in. And does working at eight o'clock at night, is that different traveling to and from work? If you're now traveling home at maybe 10 o'clock at night and you're used to traveling home at six, does that bring a different risk? So there are also different situations where people are loan working that perhaps they haven't done so before. Maybe you've got staff that would travel in by public transport and because you've kind of controlling the risk that way, you're saying, not happy with that at the minute, can you drive to and from work? And so now we've got people driving around who maybe haven't done that before, or maybe they've shared car share, um, car share with other car, car clients, sorry, with other colleagues and, and aren't doing that. So they're now alone working on their own. I was speaking to a guy the other day who does the recycling collection and he said, normally there's two of them in the cab, two of them do this, but... They decided that they can do it on their own. And guess what? He thinks that his council now is going to make that the norm, but then he can't see them going back to two people. Why would you? So I think there are going to be different situations in the future where people will be loan working. Let's just have a quick look at this um, voting and see what people said. So actually, we've got 55% of the audience today have said that there's more loan working and this will continue into the new norm, which is, I guess, why you're here today to, to listen to what we're talking about. So that's quite interesting. Thank you for that. Let's move on a little bit. Um, thinking about kind of what else may have changed, I think there's also an issue that risks and control measures may change. Certainly some people have talked to us about their control measures that they've had in place previously aren't working right now. For example, working with a forestry um, group, they had kind of what they call proximity working. So they had people who were loan working, but their controls were around the fact, yes, but Bob's only around the corner. He can get you to you quickly if there's a problem and you can alert him. So although he's not officially kind of supervising or in direct contact, you can call for help and he can be there quite quickly but they haven't got that many people going back to work yet. So actually Bob's not around the corner and there isn't anybody that he can kind of call. So, so let's have a look at kind of the risks that might be out there and, and how these might have changed. Um, as Kristen gallantly said, I've been doing this for 25 years. Thanks for sharing that, Kristen. Um, and, and over that time, you know, I, I think there's been a, a recognition around kind of what the, the risks are for loan workers. When I first started, for me, I started in that kind of personal safety field. It was all around the kind of, you know, violence and aggression, verbal abuse, harassment and stuff um, towards loan workers. And I think that even with COVID-19, we can see a difference. I was reading a report yesterday that showed definitely there is an increase in violence and aggression in retail, for example. Um, and it could be linked to the tension created by COVID. It may be around issues around, um, you know, social distancing rules and people being told to wait. And so queues are longer and people are stressed and, and there are issues there. But, but also around kind of enforcing rules and regulations. We do a lot of work in the realm. Always, and, and as you will be very aware in the UK, face coverings were made mandatory when you're travelling on board um, trains and buses, etc. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, 
Um, and already their staff are finding that there are issues when they are reminding people politely that they should be doing this and it is causing kind of verbal abuse. And we know that there have been some really sad cases where people have even used COVID-19 as kind of a, a threatening weapon, if you like, by people being spat at and coughed on, et cetera, and, and being threats of, you know, I've got COVID. So there are things there that are happening. And of course, the, the you know, the, um, the, the way that criminals act, they will use anything that they can and it will be the, the what is ever is in kind of the public fear mind at the time. So I think that this kind of fear about COVID definitely will be used um, as an aggressive tool, if you like. There may also be issues, though, I think that a change in this idea of the risk from sudden um, illness or medical crisis. You may have staff that have underlying or pre-existing medical conditions and potentially because of the close down of a lot of day to day kind of control mechanisms, they may not have that um, medical condition controlled as well as it could be. They may have missed checkups or they may not have had, um, you know, the, the treatment that they needed over perhaps the last few months. And that might mean that they're coming back to work with a less well controlled medical condition. And if you've got somebody like that, then going out and about, um, you know, how do we control that? How, do we even know about it? Have they shared that with us as a lone worker? And that's something to kind of be thinking about. And of course, the last one, this effects of isolation, stress and mental health and wellbeing issues very much has been in, in kind of the public domain over the last year or two. And I think that um, this, the, the, the people having to work at home and very much isolated has really brought this to the foreground. So I think there are a lot of things there that have been there and been underlying, um, but COVID-19 and the lockdown and the way that we are working now perhaps has just changed some of those levels of risk. I, I hope that kind of makes sense to everybody. Um, so what kind of concerns are there? Because I think there's something else that might, might have changed with people coming back to work, and that's how people feel. Um, there was a piece of research done back in, um, well, it's actually still going on. These are just the interim results. But in, in April, the Home Worker Wellbeing Survey put out these amongst some other statistics. And 50% of workers not happy with their work-life balance whilst working at home. OK, well, that's fine. But now we're going back to work. So it feels like I should feel better. But actually, there are people who are anxious about returning to work. And if you look at this YouGov poll that was done for the CIPD, 44% of people were anxious about returning to work. And I think there's all sorts of reasons why that might be happening. One of them is underneath it, this, this just this bit about commuting. 31% of people worried about the actual commute to and from work. And interestingly, that went up to 52% um, when they spoke to people in, in the capital in London. So, you know, that in itself is one small concern it might feel like a small concern but for some people it's not it's quite a big issue I think there's other anxieties about returning to work and um, from talking to clients and doing these webinars over the last few weeks these are some of the things that we've picked up there's obviously concerns about contact with potential infection you know I'm going back I'm meeting more people than I've been doing recently even as a lone worker I might be meeting more people because I'm going out and meeting clients I'm going to other people's homes potentially you know I'm not having to ring a doorbell who who's rung that doorbell 20 minutes before me or you know, I'm, I'm using an escalator and I have to use a hand dryer or, you know, whatever it might be, there's, there's issues there. And you might have certain members of your staff or your volunteers or your gig economy workers that are more concerned about the potential infection, either because underlying health issues for themselves or underlying health issues for their family. They may be in the higher risk group. You might have BAME employees or contractors, et cetera, where that's more of a concern for them. Um, it could be to do with age. There's all sorts of reasons why people will be really concerned. And I think it's, a, a, you know, it is a real concern for people. We may think well, we've put in all the control measures, we're fine. And some of us might be thinking, oh, let's just get back on with it. But there will be people that still have that as a real concern. There might also be issues around workload expectations. I haven't done my job for 12 weeks. You know, there's been a lot of stuff mounting up. I've now got to catch up. There's going to be clients ringing all the time. We noticed in the office here that suddenly the minute people went back to work, the phone just constantly. And now what we've got is lots of clients saying to us, yep, great, we want to get on and do that project because we're back to work. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, but so is everybody else which means our books have gone from being very quiet to suddenly just completely ridiculous. And if you're a lone worker, that idea that, you know, I, I've got to get out there and deal with this, that might also be a potential trigger for, for clients in terms of violence and aggression. 
they haven't seen me for weeks. They will have concerns. They will have stress issues. And now here I am in front of them. Is that going to be a potential trigger for issues and concerns? I'm going into other people's homes, potentially. That might be something that you do. When I go in wearing a face mask, is that going to create problems with communication? Is that going to create issues if I'm trying to explain something that's quite complex or maybe dealing with people who have communication concerns? It might be somebody who's hard of hearing or doesn't speak English. But we need to recognise that actually our communication comes from our body language and including our facial expressions. So just that could be a trigger for, for an issue. And actually, knowledge and skills fade. I haven't driven my car for 12 weeks. It's been sat on the drive. And now suddenly I've got to get in a car and drive around. And, and actually, nobody's checked my car for three or four months. And I'm not sure it's still OK. So it's not just about how I feel. It's about the equipment that I'm using. Who is going to go and check all of the equipment that your loan workers may be using? I'm thinking about people who are using agricultural equipment, forestry equipment, tools, anything like that that hasn't been maybe checked over the last few months. A loan worker is going to go in and pick this up for the first time and may feel concerned that it's not as safe as it should be. And then, of course, there's the issue around work-life balance. I've got to be honest, I hated working from home from start to start with. I'm now loving it. And now I'm thinking, I'm not sure I'm ever going to have time to kind of get back to work because I've kind of worked out how I make things work now. Now I've got to go back. I'm going to lose that balance that I had. And the change and the way that change is managed is a thing that we know really can affect people's kind of well-being, if you like. Um, you know, it's not necessarily that we don't like change. It's just that if change is poorly managed. If I've got a boss that's saying to me, yeah, come back into the office, it's all sorted, but is then not giving me clear guidance on how these control measures are going to work, that might be putting concerns into my mind. So it's how we, how we manage that process of change is really important as well. So, so looking at the controls, I think there's a few things that we have to make sure that we're doing. A, we have to do that COVID-19 risk assessment. We know that. Now, you don't have to do a loan worker risk assessment, and that's probably a conversation for another day, but we should be doing task-based risk assessment that look at loan working. Um, but we do need to add into the top of it then our COVID-19 risks. But please, please don't forget that just because we're now concentrating on those risks, we, should forget, we shouldn't forget about all of the other things that have traditionally been an issue for loan workers. Um, and I think that's really important as well. We need to look at how we can design the environment or the activity. You know, are the screens going to be helpful? Yes, they're going to be helpful for COVID, but does that then bring another issue in terms of potential aggression? I remember years ago when the social services in this country took away all of their glass screens and their perspex screens because they knew that that was a contributor towards verbal aggression and even physical aggression from people. And taking away the screens meant that they could be more human, more interactive, and it lowered the levels of aggression. So now we're putting screens back up. So does that now change the way I communicate? Um, and I was talking to a group on the railways yesterday and they were saying that, you know, they've got these guys at the gate line asking you for your tickets and helping you through the barriers. And they're now in basically like perspex boxes. Well, by default, they end up shouting at you. Well, don't shout at me because I can't get my ticket in the gate. Well, they're not really shouting at you. They're just shouting because of the necessities of putting a box around them. But think about how the, 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 the designs of the controls for COVID might be impacting on other things as well. I think that's really, really important. If I am saying you can't travel with a colleague, then does that have an impact on the safety of you driving as well? You know, if they're driving long distances, etc., nobody there to kind of share it with. And I think one of the biggest challenges of loan working is there's just not somebody there to turn to and say, what do you reckon? What should, what should we do now? Can you take over for a minute while I just take a break? And that, that kind of links in with that knowledge and skills fade. So we do need to make sure that we give people real clear communication. More than anything else, that's the one thing that I've been hearing from people. We're going back to work. I want to know what the rules are. I mean, look, we all feel like that. We listen to the government and we kind of hear them say, this is what we're going to do. And then there's a caveat that kind of makes the clear bit that they said at the beginning not very clear at all. And I think that that's what's happening in the workplace because the rules aren't really clear and people just want to know, how, how do I deal with this? So we need to give clear rules. We need to give clear guidance. And we need to give permission to people that if they feel uncomfortable, that they can stop what they're doing. 
If they don't feel that it's safe, it's okay. We know we're under pressure to get back to work. We know there's a lot of economy reasons why we should be doing so, but it's still your safety has to come first. So we need to let people know that that's okay. And you've got to find ways of providing training. Um, for us as a training company, that's quite challenging because we've worked out how many people we can get in a room, which is six metres by eight metres, and it's not many at all, and it's not financially viable. So you've got to start looking at more innovative ways of doing it. Um, We've been starting to produce training films. We're doing e-learning packages. We've run in some great virtual workshops, which are really useful because they allow people to have those conversations. But what I would say is if people have real concerns, when you're doing these kinds of meetings, it, you can't have those aside. So a lone worker that's worried about something that maybe if we're doing a training session would come up to you quietly in the coffee break and say, well, can I just ask this question? Everything's public on Zoom. Everything's public on MS Teams. You can't have those little, have a little word with me. So find times and find ways. And we've been looking at things like virtual coffee shops, drop-in sessions where people can come in and do one-to-ones and, and just post their questions maybe anonymously as we're doing today and getting people to answer them in that, that um, way instead. But it is important that we give people that confidence and competence to go back out there and do the work. It's really important. You might be looking at things like face covering, gloves, etc., if that's appropriate. And there's an argument about whether that's PPE or not. And I'm going to leave that one to Matthew and we'll talk about that one in a little while, perhaps. Um, but, you know, you need to think about, as I've said, if that's appropriate, how does that impact on people working um, with clients and with customers? But importantly, I think part of our controls needs to be our, our business as usual support, the way that we keep in contact with our loan workers, the way we check on their mental health. Just keeping those conversations going. Um, we've been really good at kind of communicating with people over these kind of virtual media while people have been at home. I think the challenge will be when you've got people now back in the office and back out on the road, this will subside. And this is the time when people need it perhaps more than anything else. They need to know that you're still there and to have those conversations. And of course, most importantly, if there is an incident, how do you get support to them? Have we checked that our loan worker devices and our loan worker systems are all back and running? You know, again, if they've been sat in a box for 12 weeks, who's going to make sure that they're all OK? Are our escalation processes still working? You know, if you've got a system that says, well, normally what happens is it rings through to the office, but there's nobody in the office at the moment. What is going to be our COVID-19, you know, post lockdown kind of responses? And does that work with the providers that we've got? So it is really important that we set around just taking a minute to think about all these things. And I, and I feel like I've given you loads of questions and I'm not going to apologize for that because I think there isn't a bog standard answer. If there was, it would be really simple. I can kind of just go, here you go, 10, 10 straightforward things, do these and you'll be OK. And it doesn't work like that because, you know, we started off by saying loan working happens in all sorts of different environments and different situations, different people. You may have real mavericks out there who can't wait to get back to work. You might also have more timid people who are fearful for their own safety and their own security uh, and their mental health and well-being and we've got to treat them differently but whatever we do we've just got to make sure that people know that they're not in this alone i think that's so so important lone workers but not alone they, they just feel like there's a difference with those two descriptions i've kind of gabbled on for about 20 minutes that's probably enough from me but i know Kristen, you were going to look and see if we've got any questions i haven't had a yeah. chance to look i was going to look but i couldn't do two things at we once. do we do have a couple i i'm just wondering you've talked a lot about traveling one thing that came to me is how much do you have to cover traveling? When, when does a business have to look at the risk of traveling, whether it's public transportation, private transportation, and when okay. not? So the official line is, if somebody is traveling during the course of their work, it is an employer's responsibility and they have a duty of care. So if they go into an office or they start from home and they go straight out onto site or to visit a client or a customer, whatever bit, uh, that might be, that is definitely a work journey. Normally, we'd say the journey from home to your standard place of work is not your employer's responsibility. However, remember I said to you earlier on that people are starting work really late early in the morning or working really late and doing odd shift patterns that they wouldn't normally do. It, forget kind of the legal bar because I think that's quite low set instead kind of a good employer bar and say as a good employer because I'm asking you to do something which is unusual different not what you normally do I think that should be part of your process and I know for example we've got a lot of clients that will use things like solo protect 
And as well as saying to them, you can use it during the daytime, they'll say, look, why not just switch it on the minute you leave home? You know, switch it on when you walk in the dog. I mean, that has got to be a decision made by the business. And, and Matthew's company might have different views on that. But I know that we've got a lot of clients now that they're saying, please just use it as much as you possibly can. And I think that's a, a, you know, a kind of stamp of a good employer. Great. That's really helpful, that, that um, definitions. We've got some questions about, I think people are a little bit worried about when, you know, we have our employees, but then we have all these other people. How much do they come under our purview? One question is, are agency staff reflected in that health and safety Yes. Um, executive definition. Yes, yes. The answer, that's a straightforward one. So yes, right. agency staff, because they're classed as contractors, you have a responsibility to make, and it comes under this, other bits of legislation can control the contractors, etc. But forget that for now and think back kind of health and safety. They are working for you. So they are doing a job for you. Again, we've got kind of the legal bar and then we've got the good employer bit, but most definitely agent staff would come into that agency staff, gig economy staff come into it. Now, what about, here's another question from them. Volunteers, do they yes. need to be provided with the same level of protection as employees like PPE? Okay, I'm going to say absolutely yes in terms of the definition. And I'm also going to say to you, you employ volunteers. Imagine something happened to one of your volunteers. Think about the reputational damage of your business if you'd given them a different set of controls, a different level of training, etc. Now, we know from businesses it's really hard to get volunteers to give extra time to attend training, etc. But if part of your control measure is that they have to attend training, that they have to use a personal safety device, a lone worker device, whatever it is, we have to find a way of engaging with them to do that. So, yes, definitely. And then just one question, one, one question more to answer, and then maybe we'll move on to Matthew. Somebody asked again, because it's about that loan working definition. If you, loan working is not having close or direct supervision, yeah. and they're wondering about that terminology, supervision, does it okay. include working alongside a peer and colleague? Does it just mean you're... Outside, this outside this is where, Kristen, I think that you've got to look at what people are doing. So I'll give you an example. Um, we have a client, as you will know, who work out on the roads um, and they do stuff with traffic lights and stuff. I'm desperately trying not to say who they are. Um, they've got a completely different definition because they say you are lone working unless you are with a colleague who A, understands the risks and B, would know what to do in an emergency. Now, let me show you how that works. If you and I were working together, we've both got similar levels of experience and knowledge. So we're okay, we're not lone working. If I was taking out an apprentice, mm -hmm. I'm still lone working because that apprentice may not have a clear understanding of the, the risks and may not understand what to do in, if there was an emergency. But he or she's not lone working because she's with me and I do understand the risks. Does, does that make sense? It's that it's it's difficult there's not a definition of what do we mean by supervision and i would say it depends what we mean it depends what the risks are you know if it's really scary stuff that people are doing i want to be supervised by somebody who understands all the stuff that i'm doing if i'm you know just i don't know working maybe with the public on a, on a customer service level then i would argue that a colleague who's with me that has the same level of understanding that i do would be absolutely fine but that's why that definition doesn't always work for everybody. And you've got to dig a little bit deeper for your business. Excellent. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. That's really helpful. And thank you for that presentation. For now, we will move on to Matthew. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have more time for a few more questions. But thanks, everybody. So here we have Matthew. Matthew's worked in health and safety since 2001. He has a special interest in loan working and works with Solo Protect to help safeguard the safety and security of over 150 loan workers at BPHA. Is that right, Matthew? Yes, it is. Um, yes. Um, and it, you also said that you're an exponent of sensible health and safety, which absolutely, we, yeah. like, we like you for that. So we want to hear yeah. about sensible health and safety. Over to you. Thank you. And I suppose sensible health and safety really is about a bit of a pragmatic approach. Um, I don't know about the people who are listening to this but in terms of, of my background um, yes I've been dealing with health and safety since 2001 but the company I work for BPHA I've been with them since 1996 I started off and spent the first 10 years with them as a caretaker um, out on the site dealing with an awful lot of the problems that caretakers deal with um, and that's given me quite an insight 
particularly as we've been dealing with COVID and the changes that COVID have brought into what they do and the challenges that they come up against. Um, it's interesting what Nicole was saying about verbal abuse, and I absolutely agree with that. We've noticed that uh, during lockdown, and our caretakers were obviously still out doing their jobs, um, the verbal abuse against them from various people has increased a massive amount. It's very interesting whether that is because um, our tenants aren't getting to see the housing officers or aren't getting the normal contact they get with the organisation and the caretaker is the only person on site that they're dealing with, we haven't yet worked out. But certainly the general level of verbal abuse and threats towards members of staff has definitely increased during the COVID period. And that's certainly given uh, the caretakers something to think about and has made them quite worried. Um, so if I just go back, BPHA is a housing association, as it was said earlier, we work over the Oxford to Cambridge Arc. Um, we're a developing association, which means we build properties. So as the health and safety officer for that organisation, um, I have responsibility for the health and safety of uh, the sales team who will be going out and working in um, sales environments in new build properties, you know, the, the classic Susie Lamplu type environment in terms of, of meeting clients. We have caretakers, as I just mentioned, we have a lot of cleaners, um, and we also have people who work in our sheltered and extra care schemes dealing with the elderly and vulnerable. Um, some of the things that, you know, Matt Hancock and his team have been talking about quite a lot. And I think from my point of view, you know, it was interesting because when the lockdown happened and BPHA, which was predominantly an office-based organisation with lone workers um, out there, everybody moved out of the office and everybody went to work from home and we effectively shut the office. Um, and I was still dealing with the caretakers and various bits and people, but it was interesting to think that suddenly, you know, there were still people who were out there doing their job, loan working, um, as COVID was going on. And I was directing them and talking to them and telling them about, you know, risk assessments and all the various bits and pieces that they needed to deal with. Um, sitting in my comfortable home, um, you know, not being out there on the ground. And I think, you know, I needed to give myself a bit of a reality check about that. Um, Certainly, particularly our caretakers and cleaners have come across an awful lot of situations and a lot of them are now very anxious about what they're doing. Um, in the beginning, there was the inevitable scramble that a lot of organisations had to get PPE. It was difficult to get hold of, um, you know, and we were advocating that the most important thing that you should do was maintain social distancing and we put up signs in blocks and we gave very clear instructions to all our staff that you know if they were going into a building and there were other people in the, the, the foyers of the buildings um, you know they should wait until those people cleared out the way and absolutely maintain you know a two meter social distance we also supplied to our caretakers things like um, large carriers of, of water that they could keep in the back of their vans so that they could actually wash their hands um, with soap and water because hand sanitizer was really difficult to get hold of. Um, you know, so we have to make an awful lot of changes really quickly. Um, and I don't think, you know, I think we shouldn't underestimate the, the, the effective job that the government did about telling people to stay home and telling people about the virus. And now we've ended up with a situation where an awful lot of staff are very anxious about returning to work, um, don't want to leave their homes, or are very worried about what they're actually going to be doing. Um, it is very interesting. So one of the things that I need to, to, to talk to them about, and we need to look at, is obviously their risk assessments and the thing that we use an awful lot, which is task sheets, and which is what I really wanted to talk about briefly this morning. Um, obviously, as, as you come out of COVID, risk assessments are really important. And as I often joke when I'm delivering training, if you talk to anybody in health and safety long enough, you know, the subject of a risk assessment is going to come up. It is the underpinning for absolutely everything. And we make sure that all our staff, regardless of, of where they work, um, have a job-based risk assessment. And that's an individual job-based risk assessment that they do with their line manager. Um, you know, we could put together a risk assessment for an office-based member of staff 
as an example. Um, but that then wouldn't take into account the differences between individual people. So it's important that, that risk assessment really reflects what the person's abilities, understandings are. Um, those have obviously been all updated for, for COVID and we are looking at those and they're part of the appraisal process that people go through. So it, it's become part of the culture at BPHA that people have that job-based risk assessment. But as I said, and I mentioned a little while ago, one of the things that we found really useful coming out of, of the lockdown and going back to trying to get some sort of normal working our task sheets um, and what we've had with our caretakers and our cleaners and the people in the residential schemes is a change in what we were asking them to do what they were normally doing and their normal routines have changed beyond all recognition and we were getting them to do different things because of social distancing and because of the changes um, Task sheets are one way that we can actually get them to focus on what they're doing. If you could put up one of the task sheets, thank you very much. And a task sheet is, is basically, as it shows there, a, a summary of what we're expecting people to do. Um, it will lay out for them the PPE that is required to do the job um, and exactly the steps that they're required to do. And this is really good if you're asking people to do things and you're asking them to do a job that they're repeating. This particular one is about clearing bin shoots. Um, it's just a really useful tool to actually clarify what you're needing people to do and actually gets them to understand it. Um, as I said, having spent 10 years as a caretaker myself, um, I understand what it can be like on the front line and how lonely you can feel doing that job. And I think it's really important that, you know, for, for the office-based health and safety staff, or anybody else or their line managers that you actually spend that time and, and another thing that, that Nicole spoke about was communication and that's absolutely vital it's really easy for lone workers to feel isolated to feel on their own and to feel neglected and certainly we got quite a lot of feedback during lockdown about um, our caretakers and our cleaners and the people who were out dealing with our uh, extra care schemes were the only people they thought working because everybody else was nicely sitting at home and the perception is rightly or wrongly that if you are uh, sitting at home somehow you're not working properly and the people who were out you know on the, on the streets in, in the estates were the people working and they did feel very alone and they did feel sometimes very neglected um, you know we've had to work really hard to make sure that they are included when we talk to them so we've done an awful lot of online training, an awful lot of online conversations with them, uh, virtual coffee mornings using Microsoft Teams. Um, you know, we're lucky, all our caretakers, all our cleaners and all the various people have all got smartphones, which are supplied by the company, um, which we will use to contact them. They all have um, various remote offices that they can go to. Uh, and we've had to think about the various people going into them and the cleaning regimes of those offices that they go into in terms of, you know, uh, wiping down surfaces and making sure that all the various bits and pieces are clean. Um, but keeping in contact with those people is really, really important and key to actually what's doing. Um, as I said, task sheets are, are just a very simple, sensible way of working out exactly what a job role is. And I think the other thing is it's important not to just put a task sheet together and issue it to people. It's really, really important to put that task sheet together with the people that are going to be doing the job as you would do with any risk assessment. Um, you know, I always say when, when managers come up to me and say, oh, can you come and do a risk assessment on whatever it might be? I'll always push back and say, no, actually the best person to do the risk assessment is you and the person you're asking to do the job because you're best place to do it. I'll always advise, I'll always help out, but actually you doing those risk assessments is a really important thing. Um, and I suppose that's really where I'm going to leave it today at the moment, just to say that task sheets are a really efficient and important thing to use, we find. They allow you to lay down exactly what we want step by step in terms of the PPE, in terms of the tasks, and that should be backed up by risk assessments, which I personally do think need to be reviewed, having changed the way we're working. Thank you, Matthew. That makes so much sense. I love that because it dovetails so nicely with Nicole's point about change and how we have to manage the process of change 
carefully and you know make it transparent to everyone so if you get people involved in the changes that are needed to be made for their safety and have a task sheet where steps are very you know carefully laid out so everyone doesn't feel that anxiety of i don't know what i'm supposed to do here that yeah. sounds like it's a great idea i have one question that kind of falls sure. into that which is um what advice would you give where the service involves visiting customers, where the customer may break the recommended social distance. So I guess it's that idea of how do I ask people to comply with something without getting into a sticky situation? It's actually, it's, 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 it's a real life scenario that is happening at the moment, particularly within our sheltered and elderly scheme. Mm, Notice that um, our elderly residents have really not taken to whether it's understood or don't want to follow the social distancing. You know, we gave them advice about whenever possible staying in their rooms and obviously we weren't continuing with the coffee mornings and things that, that, that the staff would normally do. But when our guys would go on site to do whatever job it was, you know, they would find that the, start, that the, the tenants were coming out of their fact specifically to meet them and talk to them it's because they hadn't seen somebody for a long time or they had specific mm. questions to ask or, or they had issues and social distancing has proved to be really difficult so you know and, and you can't really in that situation say to people right well you need to back away and leave the block and not go in there because actually sometimes you know that person that goes in from from bpha might be the only contact that person has um, so unfortunately, you know, although social distancing and washing your hands are by far the best solutions to, to, to everything when it comes to COVID at the moment, um, you're going to be reliant on personal protective equipment and we're talking about masks and we're talking about if you're needing to go into somebody's flat and talk to them at close quarters about whatever it might be, uh, face visors, etc. and disposable gloves. Um, but then we get onto the whole issue, particularly with, with, with the elderly, we found, of the face masks are, as the, as the name suggests, masking the ability to communicate with people. And it's turning out to be a real problem. Yeah. Um, one, I'll be absolutely honest, which we're working through at the moment, and I'm not entirely sure we've come up with an absolutely suitable solution for. You sure. know, we have that duty of care to protect our staff. So we need to make sure that they've got the right equipment to go and do that job which would be in this instance the PPE, but we've also got that duty because we're looking after those people in those, those schemes um, to give them you know, the best quality of, of life and talk to them as we're supposed to. And actually the solution to COVID at the moment, the mask, is actually stopping us performing quite a lot of that and is proving to be a problem. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how it's going to pan out um, but it's taking an awful lot of time and an awful lot of patience from our staff to sort of work it out and work with it. And it just, I think at the moment, it means that they're spending an awful lot more time with the various tenants, talking to them um, and spending more time explaining things because it's taking yeah. to make that. Community. And this is the thing, knock on effects. Mm. I mean, you may spend a lot more time either because you have to socially distance, you can't talk to as many people as you'd like to, like in a training situation, yeah. but also here, jobs may take longer because you need to take more time to explain because your face is covered or whatever reason everything is under transition well, one, well i was going to say just finally one of the things that we have made it abundantly clear to, to, to our guys at work is that it doesn't matter actually if doing your job takes a little bit longer um initially we had quite a lot of guys coming up to us and going but i can't get as much done as i was supposed to yeah. Yeah. Or, um, I'm really worried I haven't been able to do this and this and I'm supposed to do this and this and we've just said look you know the normal rule book has gone out the window if you need to spend more time doing this because that's the only way we can get it done that's what we need to do to get it done and that's that's how it's going to be and there has been a certain amount of just feeling as you go with Covid of course you go as you come out of it actually because it is I don't like the word because it's overused, an unprecedented situation. It is. You know, let me just, there's a couple more questions coming in. I'm aware we're coming toward the end. So I want to move on to ask a couple of COVID related questions, maybe to you, Nicole. Que question on the statistics on abuse where COVID-19 is used as a threat. Are there some? Also, what advice would you give to a team that deals with aggression normally, but that's been heightened due to the virus? 
Okay, so, so the first one is a, a, a challenging one for me to answer because I've been working with um, a couple of the police forces and with the British Transport Police. Um, and there are definitely statistics out there, but unfortunately I'm not able to share those at the moment. But there are definitely incidents that have been linked where um, it, it's happening in two ways. The, the police seem to be seeing it happening in two ways. Firstly, it's becoming an MO for criminals, that they're using that as a, as a weapon, if you like, as a tool to threaten people with. But then secondly, it's happening from that kind of um, frustration, aggression that comes out and then people end up kind of being more aggressive in that respect. But the, the ones that I think the police are really worried about is where the criminals are kind of using this as their new MO, are using it as a, a threatening tool. It happened with HIV, it happens with, you know, whatever it is that's around at the time that's in the fear level for um, the community so I think that's an issue in, in terms of how do I deal with incidents I mean it, it you know again it is I mean Matthew said normal rules don't apply and I think the challenge is that actually in terms of managing aggression normal rules do apply it's about diffusing it's de-escalating it's you know distancing yourself it's all of the stuff that we again need to make sure that people are reminded of in their training before they kind of go back out there on their own and that they are happy and confident and even if it's just like sending them a couple of little email messages saying you know remember to use your dynamic risk assessment process if you feel uncomfortable i mean i, I love listening to matthew because he obviously works for an organization that cares and has got that ethos of, of working with their um with their clients sorry with, uh, well with their clients and with their employees but I think it's more challenging where people are driven by targets and, you know, businesses are really struggling and people, if you work for businesses really struggling, you know that and you try and keep going as much as you possibly can. But safety has got to come first in all of these things, but it's, it's getting that message across. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there was a question about um, if you use a lone worker device, and is it okay to ask them to use it now for all tasks externally, even when working with others, taking into account social distancing? So, so I, I talked about that earlier on. Matthew, what's your company's view well, on that? Well, so, yeah, no, we, one, one of the big selling points when we went um, with, a, with a lone working device, which was Solo Protect, um, was that we said that people could use it at any time they wanted to use it. One of the things that, that, that you know, was a big seller is that, if you were out on a Saturday night and you had a solo protect device, you take it with you if you want to and, and use it when you're coming back on the train. Um, so our, our instruction to people is that um, when you leave home in the mornings, um, you leave uh, the Amber Alert message and log on to, to, to the uh, device. And then you leave those throughout the day and until you finally get back home in the evening and that your manager then knows you're safe. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we have a signing in and out system so that managers will know that staff that are home based who are going out onto site and coming back in again have arrived home and are safe as well as the solar protect. So yes, yeah, we get them to use it all the time. Yeah, I think a that's few, good practice. A few questions about PPE. I mean, one question I had is, are face masks classed as PPE? And someone else <laughs> asked, well, probably for you, Matthew, when, when staff visit tenant properties, are they required to wear fluid resistant masks as well as do those hygiene things and, and social distancing things i mean um fluid resistant masks no i mean i would we would we would always say at bpha that the best thing you can possibly do is maintain that two meter social distancing um you know and if you are going into a situation where you have to get closer than that and wherever possible we will triage situations so that we can deal with everything possible in other ways other than getting close to people um, which is a whole different ball game in terms of actual social interaction because people are social animals and they like contact with other people so there's a, there's yeah. a big problem around that but yeah so we, we get then people to put on uh face masks uh face yeah. etc but you know in the sort of talking to them about their rent account or, or a particular issue we're not doing uh medical interventions so we're not getting that close as a nurse so there's no need for that um you know moisture repellent mask i think as i understand it that um because 
if we're talking the difference between kind of masks and face coverings and yeah. face coverings then protect you from you know passing the virus that way whereas a mask can be classed more as ppe because obviously then it would be yeah but that has to be kind of a special grade and bsi i know have brought out some new um, um uh, rules and guidance on that as well so i think it's useful to kind of look at the, the british standards for that but, but there is an argument isn't it about whether it's ppe or not um Absolutely. You know, yeah, that, that personal protection as opposed to yeah, protecting. Exactly. Any, briefly, because they've just come in at the end, and I think this covers everything uh, that we're all worried about too, is supporting the mental well-being of working colleagues and overcome, you know, if they're scared to go out. Um, you know, I think Matthew's task-based assessments are pro trying to give you ideas, and we will share those task-based yeah. assessments for you as PDFs, or they'll, they'll be sent out, won't they, Nicole, or they could be yeah, they after this be, yeah. webinar for people who want to see them. But it's really tricky to, to support your staff. I mean, I think there's somebody else that just put a comment, comment on here that fear breeds fear. So how do we yeah. overcome staff which are scared to go out? And I think, you know, the mental health side of it, as, as well as the fear element of it, is massive. And I'm just going to say it's communication. You've, you've got to have honest and open communication with staff. We don't know all the answers. We, we, we hope that the control measures we're putting in place are the right ones and, and the best that we can do at the moment. But we want to hear from you. Where do you see the challenges being? We want to know what your challenges are and, and keep those communication channels going. You know, as I said, don't forget that just because people now aren't working from home, they still will feel isolated if they're lone workers. So you've got to keep those, whether it's virtual coffee shops, whether it's the Friday night down the pub on the phone, you know, whatever it might be that you're doing, you've got to find ways of being able to support and communicate with people. It, it's, it's vital at this time, I think. And it can take quite an effort to actually yeah. maintain contact. It's something you've yeah. actively got to do. Uh, and sometimes you'll get resistance from people, but it really is worth persevering. You yeah, know. definitely. Thank I think, I mean, we did a webinar earlier on, which was about mental health of people working from home. And we are going to be looking at it again at some point over the summer, because I think it's such a big subject. And unfair of you to ask that question. I'm you. sorry, but it is a huge component. <laughs> but we can is, invite people to look back at the webinar yeah. that focused on mental health if you want to see more about what yeah, people sure. were saying about that, but it is all about communication, isn't it? Clear communication, managing change and supporting your people. Definitely. So thank you, Nicole. Thank you, <coughs> Matthew. Hopefully to you participants out there, it's been beneficial for you today. The, the webinar series will continue. Next up, it's still about loan working, but this time the role of technology now and into the future. Nicole's guest will be Chris Alcard from Alliance Protect. So 30th of June, it's a little earlier start time of 10.30 a.m. and you can register at Lone Worker Safety Live. So hopefully you can join us for that. This will be able, you'll be able to watch this again. So uh, let, it, let your colleagues know or other people too if you'd like to share what you've heard today. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Thanks so much to Nicole and Matthew, our speakers today. And thank you, our audience, for joining us. Chris, um, and posing good questions, yes. Can I just say the questions that we haven't managed because I'm just looking at this and they're still coming in now. So if there are questions, well, I know there are questions that we haven't answered, um, we'll look at them and see whether they're a Matthew or a me question. Um, and we'll, we'll try and post those um, on, our face, uh, on our LinkedIn page, if that's okay with everybody, because they're anonymous so we can't respond independently. Good. Well, do look for those for the answers. And thank you also to Solar Protect who sponsored this webinar today. Thanks everybody. I hope you have a great day. Be safe, be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.